almost half a million foreign students, many from Asia, choose to study in Australia. It's the country's third largest export industry, worth nearly $18 billion a year. But Australia's reputation as a safe and sunny place to study is under threat after widespread reports of rape. I'm Steve Chow. On this episode of 101 East, we investigate how foreign students have become prey on Australian campuses. It's the start of the university year. Orientation week, also known as O Week, is in full swing. Along with free ice cream in the summer sun, there are first day jitters and high expectations. Nervous, excited, happy, all of them at the same time. <laughs> Australia welcomes students from overseas gladly. They pay full fees and are worth billions to the economy. The majority come from China and India. You are the journey and the destination. You are destiny, faith, hopes and dreams. You are the cure for cancer, the mission to Mars. You are the future. But there are some parts of campus life that aren't shown in the promo videos. Australian universities are facing a crisis over an abusive culture, bolstered by excessive drinking and degrading college initiation rituals. It's a culture that's been linked to a shocking level of sexual harassment and assault of students. I'm looking at you, you stole my phone, I'm looking at you. And we know that one in eight attempted or successful sexual assault will happen this very week. But most international students are too scared and too ashamed to speak up if they've been targeted. No one cares about us. It's a shameful thing for us. And now it's going to be more shameful to talk about it. There's so much stigma around it, and sometimes when you say it out loud, it makes it real. That was not your fault. <laughs> I think it's going to take me some time to believe that. <laughs> It's been two years since Liu moved from China to Canberra, Australia's capital and home of the prestigious Australian National University. I'm doing biotech and arts and majoring in biology and sociology. She was prepared for her intense double degree but knew little about Australia. I major white. Um, everyone's really tall and I, I don't know, barbecue? Lou decided to live on campus in student accommodation. She admits she was totally unprepared for the social culture she found herself in. It's really different partying and stuff, especially drinking. Oh my god! <laughs> for me, from my culture, it's really different. How we party, how we just hang out and make friends. One night, a friend of Lou's housemate followed her back to her room. So I forgot something in my room. I need to go back and get it. The guy wanted to come inside. He wanted to sit a bit, want a drink or something. He just lied on the bed straight away. I said, hey, what are you doing? And I tried to pull him up, and that's why it happened. I got pushed on the bed and then got away. He keeps saying, I'll get what I want. Um, tried to reach for help, didn't work. I couldn't move, could only scream. And when he's covering my mouth, I couldn't scream. What country was the man who did this from? He's from Australia. He's from Canada. Well, in Australia, it's more be like, go for it. And, you know, they like to be alpha, especially young guys. 
Liu's fellow international students told her not to go to the police. What we thought back then is Australian law only protect Australians. And if we report things of this, they probably think we're causing trouble for them and we probably get deported, can't finish our school. It's a shameful thing for us. It's, it's the thing you won't, you won't ever tell your parents if it's just possible to hide it. You don't want to upset them, of course. You're spending their money coming this far away to study and you got raped. It's a disgrace. Lou went to counselling but felt abandoned when her counsellor left after one session. She didn't go back. At her university housing, she switched rooms but still felt unsafe. Nightmare is really difficult. God, because you can't avoid them. They just come in. You live in the normal daytime, but at night, you know, you sleep, it just comes. Yeah. Eventually, she did go to the police. For the police movement, I think she's trying to come for me. She said, don't worry, it's definitely not your fault. But next time, just be careful. I need to be careful next time. So what's next time? And what, what, what do you mean, be careful? Lou felt shamed and alone. She never pressed charges. She says she still sees the man who raped her on the street. I wish I could have correct advice. I wish I could have more information for what international students do. It's really unacceptable. And it's a huge problem. Last year, Australia's Human Rights Commission conducted a nationwide survey. It revealed that the number of students sexually assaulted each week in a university setting would fill this lecture theatre. 30 per day, every day. One in five of them were international students. They're considered to be soft targets. And I think they're considered to be soft targets because they don't know where to go to get help. Alison Quello oversees an outreach program in Melbourne to educate international students about sexual health. She says after suffering sexual assault, students will rarely go to the police. International students just won't report sexual assault in general. I've never met one that has ever reported it. Um, and I think, you know, number one fear is definitely the ramifications it could have on their visa. Fear of the authorities, language barriers and confusion about Australia's legal and medical services contribute to their continued silence. Over several months, Alison has been helping me to build trust with a group of international students and former students who mentor them. Today, we're meeting for a candid conversation about their experiences in Australia. Hi. 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 Thanks for coming today. Thanks for having us. <laughs> for some, sex is a taboo subject in their home countries, and Australia's permissive culture has been a shock. It's a topic that's never ever spoken of, um, not even with your very best friends. Basic sex education is something they might have encountered for the first time in Australia. I do have a voice, you know, I have the place to say yes or no, which is something that you don't learn about in Sri Lanka at all. Contraceptives, obviously. <laughs> Alison says lacking that kind of knowledge puts them at risk. They're not here just for the lecture, they're here for the Australian experience. And if you're saying sexual assault is part of that, that's quite harrowing. There's a huge association with alcohol, and then with alcohol, then sex. Uh, and uh, there's a lot of bravado, that over-the-top masculinity. They'll grope you and they'll touch you and they'll say all the stuff about how they love dark girls or things like that, and it's just like, would you say that to anyone else? And they were like, oh, look at the skin on her, and, you know, kissed me on my hand because I was brown, was we brown, not white. And it wasn't like he was addressing me as a person. Once I was dancing with an Australian guy, and he started touching my butt and stuff, and I said, like, dude, what are you doing? Oh, well, like, you're, you're, you're Latin, that's what you like, and you, you agree to dance with me, so 
that's why we feel so uncomfortable bringing up issues that something has happened to us because we can't trust anyone. Talk of casual sexual harassment soon turns to more serious incidents. I remember when something happened to me and then um, I, was, I just happened to be answering a survey and then they got back to me and then they said like, this is concerning, like what you wrote here, do you want to talk to us about it? So I agreed to talk to someone. They said like, we can go with you to the police and if you report it, it's not going to be against you, your visa won't be affected. Like I still wasn't ready. So they just referred me to a counselor and to the doctors because something that was it. <laughs> all that was happening, yeah. And then, yeah, because there's so much stigma around it and sometimes when you say it out loud, it makes it real. She says despite her university's help, she didn't feel she had the support she needed. Even if you do everything to just be safe on your own, other people will always make you feel like you didn't do enough to protect yourself. More than anything, she fears telling her parents. I know that if I tell my parents that this happened to me, it will force me to go home, and I don't want that. And it's just so much easier to bury it all in, because if you're in one of those situations... and That's something the others relate to. And if something happens to you, it, it does feel like it's your fault because your whole life there's this other part of your culture that's been saying, don't dress like that, don't behave like mm -hmm. that, don't be Western like that or else mm -hmm. that'll happen to you. So then when it does happen to you, you're like, oh, well, it's my fault. Mm -hmm. And then you can't be open with your family and like turn to them for support because they don't see it that way at all. Mm -hmm. um, and they might even, yeah, be like actually ashamed of you. In the following days, I meet up with G for a more in-depth talk. She's struggling with something that happened several years ago, just weeks after she arrived from India. You do tend to blame yourself. Like, you didn't want it, so you could have been more clear. But, you know, you try to be clear. Is it clear enough? And, you know, it's such a grey area that it's hard to even think about, you know, coming out with it and reporting it. She met a guy in her class. She could tell he was interested in her, and even though she wasn't interested in him as a boyfriend, she agreed to see him several times as friends. In the context of me feeling isolated and lonely and really not knowing anybody, I really like to stress what, what that feels like, not knowing a single person anywhere around you. One night, they'd been drinking. He walked her home then took advantage of her drunken state. It's like, how much do you say no, right? <laughs> you can't continue saying no, 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 no. And when someone doesn't hear it, you're like, well, what's happening? You don't know how you're negotiating those boundaries anymore if you're constantly saying no to somebody and they're still pursuing you. Do you feel like you ever gave consent to him? Did I say the words yes? Um, no, I didn't say yes to him. I blame myself. I told myself that I was in control, even if I was drunk, and that I could have done better. It's not your fault. <laughs> I think it's going to take me some time to believe that. <laughs> this is tough stuff. <laughs> Yeah. We're one of two single-sex male colleges at the University of Queensland. And, a lack um, of understanding and, and around consent yeah, is common among all students, women and men alike. The traditional rapist jumps out from behind the bush in a big trench coat. But that's not what the real rapist actually looks like. He looks like someone that these young women can trust, in whom they've confided, in whom they've gone and had a few beers with, in whom, with whom they've gone back to a bedroom with, perhaps who have been prepared to go so far, but that's as far as I want to go. And the answer is either verbal no or, or, or non-verbal cue no. In the city of Brisbane, I meet up with Stephen Foley.
He's head of St Leo's, one of the oldest and most prestigious all-male colleges at the University of Queensland. We realised that we, we were part of the problem. You know, we, we had young men here at the college for whom we needed to assist finding a, a new normal. We have had behaviours in the past here that when I arrived four years ago, I was appalled and shocked to see. A range of them in that spectrum of things we've addressed falls this respect for women, this respectful treatment of women, and we're en route to achieving better. He's made some controversial changes at the college, like restricting the availability of alcohol and banning degrading initiation rituals. We say we're, we're producing um, students who go on and do great things because they've been instilled with a wonderful set of values and principles, but they're uh, sliding on the floor in their own vomit. Somehow those two things don't quite gel. Um, so we need to be truthful about what it is that we're looking at and call it what it is and deal with it. Good afternoon everyone and welcome to today's session. Um, as I'm sure you can all gather we're going to be talking about consent. Students at St Leo's must attend consent training every year. Today one group is having a refresher course with women from nearby Grace College. Just imagine instead of initiating sex you're making them a cup of tea. If they say no thank you then don't make them tea. Don't make them drink tea. Don't get annoyed at them for not wanting tea. They just don't want tea, OK? Consent is everything. Split up into groups around the room, guys. Other messages are about how to read non-verbal cues about someone's feelings and how to be an ethical bystander if you see someone at risk. You really don't want anything happening to you know, your little sister, your mum, any of your family members, any close friends. You've really just got to put their safety above your own pride to make sure that they're going to be safe. Is it scary as a guy to negotiate consent now? I think there is definitely a fear about it, um, even with a lot of the stuff that's gone on in Hollywood recently. I know there's plenty of guys who go, oh, well, you know, how can I even talk to a girl now? And it's basically just common sense. One thing that made it sink in for me is in the second or third week last year, we went over to another college and they had a policeman there giving a talk about like um, what like constitutes sexual assault and like what the punishment is and how much you can just completely ruin your life just on like one drunken mistake you've made and that sort of no after after knowing that like it sort of really makes you careful and really hammered home how much of a serious issue it actually is. I've seen some young men who at the end of one of these nights that have gone wrong are absolutely devastated and appalled at what they've done and have realised what they have done only after they've done it. And they're in the moment and they think what they're seeing is yes, but they need to pull back and realise that what they're getting actually is a frozen, scared person. But face-to-face -face consent training isn't the norm in Australian universities and many question why it's not compulsory on all campuses. So they didn't disbelieve me, they just didn't know what to do. And my friend goes... Back in Melbourne, I meet Emma Hunt, an advocate who wants universities to step up and do more to prevent sexual assault and support survivors. I think it can be really hard for some people to get the idea in their heads that it is actually this prominent, but it's because of the lack of reporting, the lack of trust that people have in the institutions and the people around them, that it's not spoken about. Emma lived in China during her high school years and was raped soon after arriving at her university. I was raped three weeks after I had moved to Australia. Um, so I feel like I was very vulnerable. With her friends and family overseas, she knows how devastating it is to be assaulted while isolated from the support of loved ones. Actually taking the steps to report to police or to your university can be the hardest thing you've ever done in your life. So many universities in Australia don't have any facilities in place on campus, online, uh, places where they can tell students, these are your options. This is how you can contact police. This is how you can feel safer on campus. Emma says change is beginning to happen, but more needs to be done. It took so long for me to find where to go, and when I did find where to go, I felt completely unsupported by my university. They didn't even think about any actions of removing a potential rapist from their campus. They felt that his education was as important as mine. Universities have the power to expel students accused of rape, 
who are found to have breached the university's code of conduct. Almost running into your rapist any day that you're on campus. I had that fear for three years for my entire degree. Every single day I came onto campus. Australian universities are not required to make their sexual misconduct complaint data public. But a freedom of information request revealed 575 sexual misconduct complaints, including harassment and rape, were made over a five-year period. Only six alleged perpetrators were expelled. Other punishments included a $40 fine, counselling, a warning and a note placed on their personal file. So who are these With official responses like these, it's little surprise fewer than one in ten report their assault to their university. When we don't respond to sexual assault appropriately, we're differentially impacting on students' learning opportunities, and that to me is the real inequity of universities failing to act on this problem. Criminologist Anastasia Powell says the situation could be even worse than last year's Human Rights Commission survey showed. Universities had input in the survey process and provided most of the research funding. Universities are in a conflict of interest here. It is in their interest to show that universities are proactive, that there isn't a problem of sexual assault and harassment. Um, so to have universities be the bodies that are in, um, in charge of, of conducting or, or playing a, a substantial role in that research is problematic. Paul says the response of universities has been inadequate. I think we need a national consistent, coordinated approach to this problem. And I think there's a real lack of leadership, particularly working with universities to develop a clear, transparent national set of guidelines about what is the, the minimum requirement uh, of sort of policies, practices, programs that we need to really be addressing this problem. Hi, Ella Callan. Thanks for giving us some of your time today. Margaret Gardner is the chairperson of Universities Australia. OK, so Margaret, let's start with the Human Rights Commission survey, which was released last year. Um, it showed that 1.6% of students had experienced sexual assault across 2015-2016 in a university setting. How many students is that? Ah, uh, um, I don't have that number off the top of my head. Um, it's a, significant, it's a significant number of students. In fact, one student would be too many. On my calculations, um, it's around about 11,000 students a year, 30 per day. Is this a national emergency? I think that sexual assault is something that's very important to be dealt with across society. So, yes, we've now got a better understanding of the scale of the issue and we are able to address it um, because one is too many. Do you see a conflict of interest in universities funding their own research into misconduct on their own campuses? I mean, that's a little bit like tobacco companies funding cancer research. We were not commissioning something, running it ourselves. We commissioned an independent body to do it. To be clear that what we were seeking was real evidence so we could take action. She insists Australian universities are a positive place to live and learn. And that is what international students say who finish an Australian education. They say it was, in overwhelming numbers, it was a great experience. And we work hard every single day to make sure every student will have that feeling when they leave. Sadly, not everyone has had such a happy experience. And for dozens more, today may be the day they're assaulted. But gradually, the silence is being broken. We're not silenced anymore at all. We are strong. We are so strong when we work together to fight for this change. And there's no going back from this. People won't have to feel like they're alone anymore. We, we, we should be proud of ourselves, yeah.